summer, it's July, we're halfway through the year. Can you believe that? You know, it's, most of the world calls it summer, but in Florida, we just call it life, right? This is just the way it is all the time. But there's one thing about summer that's so exciting. I mean, we just, we just can't wait because it just, it just invigorates us and it excites us, and it's salads. Many of you right now are thinking of what's that salad I'm going to make for the 4th of July here in just a couple days. And when you go to these feasts on the 4th of July, there's all kinds. Macaroni salad, potato salad, tabbouleh, uh, tosk salad, green bean, three bean salad. I'm sure they've discovered a fourth bean by now. So we got four bean salads. I mean, it's just moving too fast. But you know what? That one salad, everybody can agree on it. Everyone loves. And, and really, the recipe for it doesn't really change too much. And that's the fruit salad. Right? The fruit salad. I mean, we all love it. But I've got to tell you, when I look at a fruit salad, some people can mess it up. If they put these big chunks of cantaloupe and watermelon and then grapes on top of it, I'm like, oh, okay, that's not quite appetizing to me. When I look at a fruit salad, if I see pineapple in it, I know this is the right fruit salad. And then, oh, berries. Throw in the raspberries, the boysenberries, and the strawberries. Oh, man, it's delicious. But the trick to the fruit salad is making sure you have the right balance of all the fruits that are in there, not overwhelming it with one fruit. And that's the way it is with the fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a recipe for us that's a perfect blend of the characteristics in order for us to be fruitful in our lives. And there are nine fruits that go into this salad. And again, an equal amount of all of them are important. So here's how Paul introduces this in Galatians 5. So you can turn to Galatians 5, and then a little bit later we're going to go over to Matthew 8. And this is what he says at the beginning. He says in verse 13, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. What's he saying here, this introduction to all of it? First of all, as believers, we have the freedom to say and do whatever we want. One sin isn't going to cause you to lose your salvation. However, we can't use that freedom now to go and say, hey, I can go do whatever I want. I can say whatever I want, and uh, I don't care. Well, we should care. So this is what he says. Verse 16, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other so that you are not able to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. What's he saying here? All right, you're going to have this battle inside of you. Look, if you are an unsaved person, all of a sudden you receive Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit moves in, there's going to be a battle inside of you. In fact, if you've been a Christian 20, 25 years, the battle is still going on inside of you. Hopefully you're doing a little bit better in it. But what he's saying is that the spirit and the flesh are always going to be at each other, pulling at each other. One is sort of saying in the one year, no, you need to do this. The other is saying in the other year, no, you need to do this. And it comes down to you making that choice. But you should not just, hey, go, I'm going to do whatever I want. If you're a Christian, you should be following the spirit and listening to what the spirit tells you to do. He goes on in 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness and orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Any of those things in the list sound familiar to you? Maybe this week? Maybe just this morning? There were acts of rage and dissensions and jealousy and all kinds of things just happened, and it's just 1130. Sure, we all battle with these things, but when we read this, we go, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 what does it say? Th th those that live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God? Am I in trouble here? He's talking about people that solely operate on the flesh. 
They've had no spirit in their life. They've had no moment of surrender in their life to Jesus Christ. But they've been living this way all the time. This is the recipe that they choose for their life. And there is no spiritual choice at all. It's kind of like their salad. If you saw all the salads and you walked by this one, it would be black licorice, old chewing gum, and anchovies. And you would go, oh, that's disgusting. I would never eat that. You know, now that I'm a Christian, I see that. That's horrible. Why would you ever choose that? So he's saying here, why, Christian, are you choosing those things? Why are you choosing to dine on those things? I mean, that recipe is, as he says, is, is very obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, hatred, jealousy, rage. And God's saying, no, don't choose that. That's not the recipe for Christians. The guide to follow, he says, comes right after it. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. So what we're going to be doing in this series this month is covering some of these fruits. But all of them are important. Why? Because there's a lot of Christians out there who are not acting like Christians. Christians. There's the elderly who feel they have the right to be mean and cranky. There are students out there who go to the school and say, we're Christians and we go to church, yet they make fun of the weird girl down the hallway. There's the political minded these days who feel it's their patriotic duty to curse and demean and to hate others on Facebook. Hey, and no wonder the world looks at us and says, they're a bunch of hypocrites. You know what? They're right. You know, we preach righteousness. We want to live up to the standard of Christ. We think that's important, but we fail all the time. But just because we fail doesn't mean we can't try. We need to try, and we need to try harder, and we need to do it with humility at the same time. Never thinking that, oh, we've arrived, and I'm 100% with all nine gifts, uh, 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 fruits of the Spirit. I've arrived. I'm like perfect right now. You never should be saying that. You never think, hey, I'm better than other people. I'm way better in joy and, and peace than that person. That's not what it's about. We are all fallen followers. But we should be trying harder, always trying to live up to Christ's standards. So today we're going to look at one of those nine ingredients, and that's faithfulness. So how do we be more fruitful in our life? How do we be more faithful in our life? So some people think that the minute you become a Christian, zap, boom, I'm perfect. <laughs> it's all arrived. I got everything I need. I got the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, boom, I got it all, 100%. And it doesn't work that way. And we get frustrated. We go, wait, am I really saved? Am I really saved? I'm not perfect. What's happened? Well, if you were going to make a fruit salad, it's not like you put out the bowl on the counter in the kitchen and you go, fruit salad. And it shows up. Doesn't work that way. What do you have to do? Well, you got to get in the car. Or if you have an orchard, you go out to the orchard, pick the fruit. Usually, most of us get in the car. We drive to the grocery store. We find the fruits. We pay for it. We put it, put it in our car. We drive it back. We set it out on the table. We cut it up. And we assemble it. We put it all together. It takes some effort to make the fruit salad. Well, it's also going to take some effort to be, have a fruitful life. You're going to have to work at it in some way. And the first thing you have to do is we have to follow the guide. We have to follow the guide. Galatians 5.16. Here's what it says again. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. You've got to pursue them. If you want it, you've got to go get it. So in Galatians 5.22... When he gives that list of all the things, he says, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The last thing he said on there is very important. There is no law against these things. What is he saying? There's no law. Well, there's no law in the Bible that says, thou shalt be joyful. Thou shalt be peaceful. Thou shalt be good. Thou shalt be faithful. There's no list of laws that you have to live by. What it's saying is you should want to. You don't have to, but you should want to live this way. The Holy Spirit will produce those things in your life if you're uh, guide, being guided by Him in all that you do. So what does an unfaithful Christian look like? 
so that we can sort of understand if I want to be faithful, well, help me to understand what an unfaithful looks like, and I'll know if I need some help. Well, here it is. First of all, you're consumed by worry. The other is that you're overcome by doubt, or that you trust in money and power and prestige and position in your life by worldly standards. Or you're also the kind of person that's never giving, but you're always hoarding and holding on because you're afraid that you're going to lose it because it's what you trust more than anything else. Those are good signs that you need help in this area of faithfulness. So, how do I know I have faithfulness? Let's look at Matthew 8. Here's how one person, uh, Jesus looked at and he's like, wow, this guy's got a lot of faith. Well, let's see what he did and then that'll help us in our lives. In Matthew 8, verse 5, it says, When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And to that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. And he said to those who were following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Wow. Can you imagine getting that accolade from Jesus Christ? I have not seen anybody with such faith as you. Wouldn't you love to hear that when you see him face to face? Then he'd say, man, I've seen a lot of people out there who thought they were faithful, but you exceeded them all. He had something. He did something. What was it the centurion knew? What did he do that got Jesus to praise him for his faith? First of all, he had strong conviction. Strong conviction. Here's where we see it. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. So any of you are bosses out there. You're the boss of the, I don't mean the home. I'm talking about at work. You're the boss. You're in charge of some people. How many people out there would say, hey, I'm the boss? I'm the boss. Oh, we have no bosses here? You're all employees? Okay, we got some, we got some bosses. Okay, so when you're the boss, you know that there's a, there's a certain amount of, hey, I want this to happen, I want this to happen. The centurion was that kind of person, the person that they all looked up to. And when, they look, when the people that you look up to, you say, well, I, I trust that person, or I have, a, I have a certain knowledge they can handle this situation. If you're the boss, you've got to be able to be in that position. This is what the centurion was. He was a person that had a strong conviction. People liked him for that. But in this case, what conviction means is knowing with all certainty. Knowing with all certainty. Now, did he know all the facts? I mean, did he know everything? No, he didn't know everything. In fact, he didn't have all the information on Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ hadn't died and resurrected yet and ascended into heaven. He just had a little bit of information from where he was in Capernaum. He had just a little bit of information. He had heard stories, but he was at the point of his life, even though he was the boss, he was at the point of his life, he says, you know what? It's not about what I believe about myself and my situation and what I can handle because it's not working here. I'm going to put my belief in something else outside of me. And you know what? He was a good man, too. Luke 7 talks about the centurion. It said that he loved the country and he gave to the temple. That's pretty interesting. This guy's from Rome. He's, in, in essence, the invading army. And yet it says he loved Israel and he gave to the temple. And also look at the fact of what he's doing here. He's trying to help his servant. I mean, it's a servant. It's not his wife. It's not his child. He's helping this one of the guys that helps around the house. But that sort of compassion we see on his, on his side describes who he is. And he had enough faith to risk his position as a Roman centurion to seek out Jesus for help. Remember who we're dealing with here. Even though he may be a good guy, the line of work he was in, 
They crucified people. In fact, it was Roman centurions that beat and crucified Jesus Christ. And yet he says, I have a strong, I have a strong belief that Jesus can heal. Him. Now that's an internal response. The second one, complete trust, is an external response. So inside, conviction, I believe, and I believe this strongly. The trust is what is the next step he takes in his life as a result of what he believes. We see it in verse 9, for I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, that one, come, and he comes, and I say to the servant, do this, and he does that. And that's what Jesus heard and says, wow, and you came to me? <laughs> what faith do you have? So a Roman centurion, so you understand that term, is in charge of a century of people. That's a hundred. You know, a hundred people working under him. He's a big deal. And yet, even though he has all that authority and all that power, he still calls Jesus Lord. He put aside his own earthly authority to surrender all authority to God. So to exhibit this fruit of faithfulness in your own life, you have got to call Jesus Lord. He is the authority of your life. If you're in charge of your life, then he's not. He, then he is not in charge. You must trust him fully and completely. Well, when I was researching this, I thought, I want to look into this thing called trust falls. <laughs> Have you heard of that, the trust falls? The people that sort of back up and then they fall and the people catch them and everything, right? So I, I found one that was trust fall fails. <laughs> I wanted to see where these things went wrong. And I was watching them. And they're pretty funny, actually. Uh, some of them, kids, do not try them at home. There were people on the roof falling and, you know, people just could not catch them and they hit the concrete. <laughs> and then there was others where, <laughs> it was funny, but uh, there, were, there were others where the, there's people like this and they're holding hands to catch, but the weight of the person pulled them together and they smacked their heads together. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Um, and others just, they couldn't ha handle them, so they just fell through. But there's one thing I always noticed with the person who was doing the fall. Is they were going up, and they were going backwards, and they were going, okay, is everyone ready? Okay, you guys ready? I'm going to fall now. I'm going to fall now. You watch. Okay, you good? You right? And in their mind, you know, they're assessing, okay, I got one, two, three, I got, I got eight people here, and he looks pretty strong. I think he can catch me, and okay. All right, here I come. I'm going to fall now. I'm going to fall now. And I'm going, why is that a trust fall when you're in charge? If, if you're calling the shots and looking at the situation, that's not trust. That's just stupidity. That's just falling. That's all that is. There's no trust involved. And that's what we do in our life, isn't it? Is it we, try to, we try to tell God, oh, God, I have faith in you, so if you could um, do this at this time uh, with these resources and these people and, um, you know, with this budget, <laughs> so to speak, we're going to give him all the things that he needs to do. He's not in charge. You're in charge. You're the boss trying to tell the one who's really in charge what to do. So there's no trust in all of that. The centurion had enough faith to say, Jesus, you don't even have to be there and you can heal this servant. Hey, most times, I mean, in almost every situation, Jesus showed up, put mud on their eyes or, or, or touched their, their head or whatever, or he just, he was there physically there. This is the one time that the security even went, yeah, I heard the stories where you actually showed up, but I trust you so much you don't even have to show up. Wow. That's when Jesus went, oh, you're really trusting me. And in our own lives, we have to get to that place. We have to get to the place to say, you know what, Lord, I trust you, even though this doesn't even make sense. I, I, I don't know how this, I don't know what you're going to do. And I don't know how you're going to do it. But I completely trust you. I completely trust trust you and I'm putting all my faith in you and I'm not putting any faith in myself that's trust that's complete trust that's taking that first step for that centurion to take that step he's saying I believe you can take care of it he didn't just believe it inside he expressed it he said it verbally and he got results and that brings us to the third point confident strength confident strength hey starts here right you got, the, you got that, uh, that faith inside of you, that conviction, and then it leads to that first step of trust. What's the result? 
strength. You have confidence, strength. Look, when, when Jesus said, go, let it be done just as you believed it would, and the servant was healed at that moment, do you think the faith and the confidence in that centurion went up or down? Oh, man, it went through the roof. Because of that situation, his faith grew. He became more faithful as a result. And you can't grow stronger in your faith unless you are tested and challenged. You don't grow stronger in faith unless you have to exercise your faith at times. I have a great story that helps, you know, helps help me to understand this. So this isn't a full-time job with me. It hasn't been for almost 20 years when I've been here. I've always had another job that, that I've worked with. And that job, uh, our financial security is really more invested in that. And uh, we were going through a financial crisis for Dave Ramsey. I don't even know if Dave Ramsey could have helped us this time. But the other work just wasn't coming in. And I was finding I needed to put some more hours in. So I was substitute teaching, you know, in the morning and the afternoon. I was working at Universal at night. I was picking up uh, jobs, whatever I could pick them up, and working here at the same time. I was doing everything. My wife was working, full-time job also. We were doing everything we could in order to make our bills, but it just was not enough. We didn't panic. It was hard. I mean, it was hard, but it, we, we didn't panic. We always had this faith that God was going to take care of us. He had so many other times before. But this was that moment we had gotten to where it was like I had this bill to pay and I had this bill to pay. Which one am I paying? And I decided not to pay this bill. Well, this bill was the mortgage. And so I'm paying all the other bills, but I'm lapsing on the mortgage. And you know what happens if any of you this has happened. You miss the day one, and all of a sudden there's registered mail coming to you. Red letters. You're delinquent. Pay now. You know, and you feel very threatened. And I'm calling them, and I'm saying, guys, I get it. Um, uh, look, I want to pay it. Believe me, I'm not running away on this. I just can't do it. And they were actually very nice to me, and they were being very helpful. But that second one came. I couldn't pay it. And then the third one, I couldn't pay it. And so, you know, we're just at this place, and it was, at this time it was around December, and it was Christmas. And basically we said to our kids, they were kind of college and high school at the time, we just said, hey, we're not going to have Christmas. Sorry. We'll celebrate it. We'll be together. That's what's most important. Everybody agreed. Everybody was on board. We were praying for a result out of all this. Now, I told people about it. I didn't announce it. You know, I didn't stand up on the platform and say, hey, wait, wait, I got a telethon going on. Give to me. I didn't do any of that. Our small group knew, right? The small group was helpful. We got, we got checks and surprises from them. And that's what small groups are all about. So we really appreciate it. It wasn't enough, though. So I got this call on Christmas Eve. And to this day, it just, just stuns me. There's a guy who went to this church. We were good friends with the family. Hadn't been in our church at the time. Been away. And uh, he says, um, I, I, and I don't know how he knew. I have no idea how he knew. He says, you know what? I, God just told me to sell my motorcycle and give you the profit. I'm like, who, who told you? God. And he writes us a check. He delivers it on Christmas Eve to me. I was at home at the time. And I take the check. And I'm not kidding you. It was the delinquent amount that we owed on all the past bills keeping us current to where we're at right now. Now, I saved that for Christmas Eve when it was time for us to open the gifts. And you can imagine how our whole family just crying and in tears over all, all of that. It was amazing. Now, what do you think our, our uh, faith is like right now? It's pretty strong. We think back at that moment and we go, oh, yeah. God's got us. We don't panic because we had a moment to exercise our faith, and God came through, and we're able to always look back at that story and say, thank you, Lord, for that. But the problem is, and I go through the prayer requests, I see them, everybody's panicking. Oh, no, Lord, why? Oh, no, Lord, take this away. These are opportunities for us to grow stronger in our faith. These are the times where we can have a testimony so we can stand here sometime and give God all the glory and say to him, look what God did to us. It's amazing. I couldn't figure it out. He wants us to have that kind of faith. And so these crises come along to test us and to make us stronger. Don't pray it away. Embrace it. 
so that it can empower you and make you more confident in your, in your faith. But you know, there's another story of faithfulness in the Bible. It didn't go as well. It seemed to. It started out, but it didn't go as well. The story of Peter walking on the water with Jesus. It's in Matthew 14, verse 27. Let me give you sort of an overview while you're turning to it. There's a storm. The apostles, disciples are out there in the boat, and they're rowing away, and the storm is coming, and they don't want a storm coming, but it's coming, and they're panicking, and all of a sudden they look out, and here comes Jesus just walking up. What's up, guys? And I don't think he did that, but I mean, you get the idea. He was like, there's no panic on his part. He just sort of walks up, and they're, we're struggling here, you know? And Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. Don't be afraid. In essence, I'm here. Lord, it says in 28, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. So Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, and in other places it says he saw the waves also, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. And you don't want to hear these words. You of little faith. He said, why did you doubt? Now look, all, all those three points we just talked about, you could apply them to this story. Strong conviction? Hey, if it's you, I'm coming to you. Peter knew. You can walk on water, so can I. Strong conviction. Complete trust. Peter took that step. and said he got out of the boat. Right? Complete trust is from here to here. <laughs> right? Took that first step. It's working. I'm walking. I'm walking on water, and I'm going towards you. Do you think he's confident in, in, in his, his faith? Do you think he's growing stronger? He's like, this is working. This is awesome. And then what happens? He saw the wind. He saw the waves. So as he's looking here, he's going, wait, what's that? Wait, 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 wait. what's that? What's hey, look, it's coming from all sides. Ah! Down. Why did Peter sink? Why did Jesus say to him, you of little faith? He lost his focus. He lost his focus. It was, it was he and Jesus, but then the wind, and then the waves, and he started to see those things on the peripheral, and he began to go down. And then he started paying attention to them. And then he started saying, they have authority over me right now, and they're going to they're gonna take me down. And you know what? They did. They took him down. And that's the last point. We've got to focus on the guide. When we lose our focus, we lose our conviction. We lose our trust. We lose our strength. And we sink. So we have to keep our focus on the Holy Spirit. Listening to that voice inside of us saying, no, 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 no. Do the things of the Spirit. Trust in God. Don't do the things of the world. And when you keep your focus, you're able to take that step of faith you're able to have that strong conviction, and your faithfulness increases, and you're stronger than ever before. Now, some of you here today, I mean, you're facing one of those challenges right now. And probably just today you're trying to pray it away. Lord, take it away. Take it away. I don't want to deal with it. Please. And he's saying, no, I sent it to you for a reason, to make you stronger. So I don't know what it is. We all have our thing that we're dealing with, relationship-wise, work-wise, financial, uh, our kids, our parents, whatever it is we're dealing with, you are probably facing one of those situations that's challenging your faith. And what I'd like to do is for our response is to pray for you. But in order for me to pray for you, I would love it if you take a step of faith and just stand right now and say, I'm one of those people. I'm not going to ask you, hey, give us a testimony. Tell us what that's... I'm not going to do that. That's between you and God. But if you're one of those people that are facing that crisis right now, just stand right now. Just stand. Let me pray. Father, we want to be more faithful. We really do. We want to be able to say we trust in you completely. And Lord, right now, we do not have all the information. We do not have all of the answers. We don't know how these situations are going to work out that the people are standing for. We don't know. But here's what we do know. You're in charge. 
you're the authority. You determine what happens. You say go, you say come, you say stand up, you say sit down. You're in charge of it all. That's all we know. So Lord, in all of these situations, we truly give it all to you. We're not making any demands on you on what you need to do. We're just going to trust you to do whatever it is you need to do so that our faith can grow and that we can give a story later on at some time about how you were faithful in our lives. Lord, there is a world out there that is panicking and they're confused and it's chaos. But Lord, I pray that they would see our faithfulness. They would see our security. They would see our trust. They would see our hope and what we have and that would be attractive to them. So, Lord, use this situation for us to grow stronger, whatever it is these people are standing for. And, God, we don't know when or how long it's going to take, so, Lord, we're going to need that other fruit, patience down the road. But, Lord, in all of it, this is what we would love. Oh, we would love it so much. That in the end, however you work it out, that we can say one day, one day that our God was faithful and our God came through and our God reigned supreme overall. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.